morning, commissioners and parks representatives committee. Um, welcome the citizens of Clovis to our parks and recreation meeting and the public that is on Facebook. I guess we have Facebook today. Um, Ms. Reyes, can we have a roll call? Commissioner Paula? Commissioner Casaus? Here. Commissioner Jones? Here. Commissioner Porter? Sabre Smith? Here. Jamal Williams? Here. Gilbert Salguero? Thomas Martin? Here. Philip Frazee? Here. And Bob Ockut? Here. Okay, it seems like we have a quorum. Uh, did everybody have time to read the minutes? Thomas? Okay. Um, if everybody has no objections, we will approve the minutes. Do I move for approval? I move for approval. Thank you. Minutes were approved. Anybody opposed? Thomas was not here, so count him absent for last meeting. <laughs> okay. Item number one, discussion and recommendation, recommendation regarding a memorandum of understanding between the Hillcrest Park Zoo and CDR3 for Disaster Relief Collaborative for Exotic Animals. Damien, can we have the report, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a PowerPoint up here. <laughs> Only one this time. Okay, so, um, uh, so ZDR3 um, is the Zoological Disaster Response Rescue and Recovery. Um, it is the largest, um, it's, it's the largest response organization in the U.S. for zoological institutions. And um, so I propose um, that we join this, this organization. So let's see if I can figure this out. So, um, so who is ZDR3? Um, it's a professional network. Of, of zoo professionals, aquarium professionals, um, from uh, wildlife ranches, conservation organizations. Um, so there's more than 120 facilities in 29 states, as you can see on the map right there. Um, but there is a gap in this organization, um, which is in the state of New Mexico, um, Arizona, Colorado. So um, I had the pleasure actually to go to Albuquerque last week um, to a whole, whole bunch of zoos in this state, some in Arizona, some in, in Texas, uh, and we we're discussing ZDR3 about how important it would be. One is, um, uh, I, I definitely didn't expect how strong the winds were here <laughs> uh, before I moved, um, and having us having to close a zoo when the a, a winds are 30 miles an hour or more, that kind of got me thinking that if if we did have a tornado or any kind of other disaster, um, it would really be hard for us to recover. So. Joining this organization, uh, we would definitely have a lot of help from zoos that are close by. So on here, um, why we would would want to join, um, if we did have have um, a, a significant uh, disaster here in Clovis, um, the city, a lot of those resources are going to go more towards um, uh, the response for the human needs um, and not necessarily the zoo. So we would kind of be there to fend for ourselves and having such a small team at the zoo, um, you know, this would link us up to Amarillo, um, other expecting to join um, Roswell, Albuquerque. Uh, so if we had a lot of enclosures that, you know, were completely down, um, a lot of trees that were down, um, and then they can come to the rescue and um, help us. So, so we would have a lot of manpower, we'd have a lot of equipment, um, a lot of equipment that we might not have. Um, you know, they can bring lots of chainsaws and things like that, so we can get up and running quickly. Um, and also, um, our animals can be transported to, uh, to a safer area until we could actually um, open up the zoo. Um, and so what, uh, what does it cost us? Um, actually, it costs us absolutely nothing. It is, it's, it's free. Um, it's only thing um, uh, you would have to send, um, uh, you'd have to sign a MOU with this organization. Um, the only responsibilities that the city would have is what the costs would be. Um, so say Amarillo had a natural disaster, um, and then we got the call uh, from ZDR3 that, uh, that they need our assistance. You know, obviously, um, 
you know, we, we, oh, oh, we're on the payroll for the city and plus, you know, you know gas for our, our vehicles that get there and lodging. But most people, uh, when they respond to um, any of these disasters, uh, they're either camping on grounds for that facility or they're sleeping at, um, uh, in their vehicles, uh, basically just because you're working around the clock. I'm just trying to, you know, it's from, it's from trying to fix the fences. It's from trying to re uh, uh, like relocate animals. It's trying to take care of the animals. Um, you know, uh, they might need a driver to actually drive them to another facility. Um, so that's the kind of work uh, that they're really looking for. And how does it work? Um, so if we had, um, if we had a disaster, if we were the affected facility, um, so I would contact ZDR3, um, and then they would actually call um, other facilities that are close by that may have the resources that, that we're gonna need. So um, if it's a bunch of downed trees, you know, we're gonna need a lot of people that are skilled um, oh, with chainsaws and skilled with um, heavy machinery uh, that can move those trees and things like that. So um, if we did sign the MOU and then we said, hey, like we're, you know, our expertise is this, and it's not cutting down trees, then they're not gonna contact us. You know, they're gonna try to fit the right people into that. Um, so, uh, so basically, um, I would call them. Uh, they would start uh, notifying other organizations. Um, and then ZDR3 would act as a central communication hub, and then help would be on its way. And that's usually under 36 hours is when help would be here. Uh, but just keep in mind, too, um, the affected facility would tell ZDR3 kind of what they need. Um, so it's not that, uh, that this organization is coming in and then they're taking over. Uh, like we're still in full control um, and we're still telling them, here's our needs. Um, they're there to ass um, assist us, but they're not there to actually direct us. And, um, and how do we join? Um, we just have to sign the MOU, uh, which I believe uh, was sent to all of you. Um, and then we have to follow their code of conduct. And now um, if, if we would get a call um, and say it was for Albuquerque and you know, we're extremely short staffed um, and we just can't send anybody, you know, that's okay too. You know, we, you know, we would just tell them you know, um, uh, that the needs here at our facility, you know, we just can't spare the resources um, and that's okay. It's just um, you know, if we have the resources to send, um, they just expect us to, uh, to participate but it's not mandatory. And, um, and these are kind of some of the needs uh, that they need. Again, um, you know, I, I talked about the chainsaws and things like that, but they also need um, uh, like a crew leader, which is usually uh, like a facilities manager um, or the director. So if we sent our team, then I would be in charge of, of the team that, uh, that we sent, um, you know, people to operate, um, you know, to help with fence repairs, um, habitat repairs, truck drivers, animal care personnel, and also communication and administrative support, which can relay information back to ZDR3 as well. So there's, I mean, there's needs for a lot of different people in the organization. And um, this is just a couple of, a couple of the past facilities um, that needed help. And, and you can see some of that damage is pretty extensive. And um, I believe the one uh, with the tree on the top right you know, they said that that would have took them weeks and within 24 hours they had the pathways clear. So, I mean, it is, it is really good to actually join that. And, um, you know, as, as we were looking at creating a, like a disaster relief plan for the zoo, um, you, know, you know, this popped up. It's, again, um, it's, it's a voluntary thing to join. And I mean, I just, I just feel it's, it's just the right thing to do just to protect our zoo and um, to help other, other zoo facilities. Thank you, Damien. Good report. Uh, do we have any questions or recommendations? You don't need to push the button. And he's here. He's got to press the talk. Yeah, there you go. I've got to press talk. Yeah, there <laughs> we go. I, so you're signing this for the zoo, is, is what is what we're saying. Uh, yes, sir. So the um, uh, the MOU, uh, which I believe uh, that you all got sent, it's just basically pretty much what um oh, what i had just said um almost exactly i don't think i missed anything but it was yeah it's just um uh, just saying uh, that we're part of this organization um that 
um, is yeah, there. My, my question that. was just who, who signs it, whether the city had to sign it or whether the um, zoo signs it? Or? Yeah, uh, actually the zoo director has to sign it. Um, and um, yeah, it has to be um, an uh, animal facility um, that cares for exotic animals. Um, so it's, it's the highest person um, at the zoological facility. So Damien, uh, can anybody, like you said Amarillo is one of them, they're already in this group, is that right? Uh, uh, no sir, so um, Amarillo, Alamogordo, Roswell, Albuquerque, um, those ones definitely um, are are looking at signing it too. Um, uh, they're going through their boards and all of that too. Um, uh, just so that we have a network kind of in this. Are you going to be able to transfer animals out of here to other locations if you have to? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So um, uh, it would be the same for, for us too. And um, actually Russell and I kind of talked about that earlier as well is, you know, we're trying to identify areas where we move animals. Um, so before I even heard about this organization, you know, working with um, Amarillo and Roswell and seeing what kind of space they have for, for our animals. Um, so we we're trying to do it ourselves. And then we found out, we're like, hey, the, you know, there's this whole organization that's already um, already doing this. Uh, so it, it just made it so much easier um, than us trying to try to piece it together and just trying to start over from scratch. So this is um, exactly what we wanted, but it's already been in effect for many years. Well, do the responders have to be associated with the zoo and like your employees, or could it be like in our case, if we're responding to Amarillo or vice versa, can they send other people besides the employees? Uh, it would have to be somebody that's um, associated with the zoo. So um, and anybody from Parks and Rec, um, I would be able to go. So if, you know, if, if, if Russell wanted to send a few guys, um, Okay. You know, help with some maintenance. Uh, they would be able to, but yeah, it has to be uh, within that circle of the zoological facility. That's all I have. Anybody else? Yes, Thomas. Yes. Better. All right. Um, Oh, within the zoo, do we have empty stalls that would we would be able to facilitate, or is is that something that we'd plan now in the future? Um, can, I'm assuming in certain cir circumstances you can have like animals with like animals, and sometimes you can't. Uh, but is that now part of a, a future thought process? Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, actually, right now uh, we do have some empty habitats because we have been putting animals together um, uh, and some multi-species habitats um, so we do have some space uh, we don't have have a lot um, but one thing that we do have um, is we do have a lot of crates um, so we you know um, uh, we're in the process of getting crates for every single animal that we have at the zoo so if there was a disaster that we could move them um, so uh, we could bring those to actually uh, assist in moving the, um, uh, the animals um, and anything that uh, that we bring in if, if we were to assist, we actually take home that same day. So it's not like we're letting them hold on to them for months um, and then and then we don't have them. Um, it would just be, you know, for us to move the animals and then we would take all of our crates back. It sounds like a win-win situation to me. I'd, I'd make a motion that we allow him to join this organization. Second. Okay, may we have a roll call or vote? All in favor, say Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Same sign. Okay, motion approved. Second, discussion and recommendation regarding land water conservation funding previously awarded for improvements at Goodwin Lake Trails. Ms. Burroughs. Yes, thank you and good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Parks and Recreation um, Committee. In front of you there is, a, I've given you a piece of paper and um, back in November of 2021, the city of Clovis uh, um, uh, submitted an application to the Land Water Conservation Fund for $150,000 of a total $300,000 project to make improvements at the Goodwin Lake Trails. Um, the yellow uh, circle that you see there is the uh, proposed new trail that they were going to put around um, uh, Goodwin Lake. And then there's a little white 
a rectangular box just south of that, uh, which is a play was going to be a playground area, and then to its right, a little grey area, which is a parking lot. It was going to be a new parking lot because, as you know, the city of Clovis has sold a piece of land on um, Prince Street, and so we were looking to have a, a parking area there um, off Arsenega. Um, on March the 7th, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bryant, Megan Darrow, who's our new grants lady, and myself met with Robert Stokes. He's the Program Support Bureau Chief um, for the Land Water Conservation Fund with Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources. And during that conversation, um, it, was a, it was a allocation site visit, and this thing has taken an inordinately long, this is the longest grant I've ever been involved in. Um, um, he's advised that this piece of land that is delineated in that with that red boundary will have to be kept as it is in perpetuity. This is a federal mandate as part of this grant. Um, that caused me some reason for consternation um, because this is part of a drainage channel that the city of Clovis has and there may be a need to, uh, to excavate into the the Goodwin Plier for, I, I cannot imagine for whatever reason, but it could happen. Um, when I met with Dr. Stokes, I did ask him, uh, you know, so when you say in, per in perpetuity, how in perpetuity is that? And he said, you know, you, you maybe could get out of it, but it would take a lot of um, activity on the part of the city of Clovis to, to make that happen. So it is with a heavy heart I come to you this evening to ask, you know, really, what, what do you think? Um, uh, maybe we should not go forward with this grant. I mean, uh, the, the amount of the funding we were going to use uh, was to buy a playground, to put a playground in that playground area. Um, that was going to be the $150,000 of the piece that, the, uh, that we were applying for the federal grant for. So we could go ahead. Of course, the, the city commission was allocating funds from the sale of that land to be used for park improvements and Goodwin Trails was part of that. Um, so if there's enough funding, we could maybe, you know, I mean, we'll continue and do the do the uh, walking trail around there and, and the parking area and so on. Just wouldn't, we just wouldn't do that playground maybe. So I was just looking to you this evening for some input, um, being as I came to you when we started this process to see what your, what your thoughts might be. Um, and then uh, what, I, what I do not want to do is to offend in any way the land and water conservation folk. Um, you know, we're going to be looking to them as we move forward with uh, Ned Hook and the work we're going to be doing out there. And of course, I'm sure if they um, uh, give us funding out there, that will be in perpetuity, but it's, it's a slightly different situation where we're, it's not part of a drainage channel. Um, of course, like the shooting range that Mr. Coffin's involved with, um, that's uh, that's uh, uh, has to be kept in, in you know, for a period of time because of the federal funds that have come down. So sometimes we run into this, and it's, it, we hadn't expected it. So, thank you, Miss Burrows. So if we don't approve this recommendation tonight, that land is still available for sale, right? Say a business wants to come in. Uh, yes. So. Um, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Parks Board, the area on Prince Street is still, there's not part of this project. The only area that's part of it's this uh, grant is everything inside that red line. Okay. Um, so if you were one, if the, if the commission, um, you know, if the Parks Board was to make a recommendation to continue on with this grant, um, then that would be kept in perpetuity. You couldn't sell any of this other land or do anything within that red boundary. The only thing that I could ever envisage you doing in the red red boundary area is to put more drainage in, or um, you know, I, you know, some some kind of other land activity relate, related to future development um, to the north or northwest of this area. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Miss Burroughs. It's probably not a good idea to go forward. I mean, as we go through the Playa Lakes issues within the state, of, and especially this area, we start talking about potentially redoing some of the Playa Lakes and bringing them back to where they need to be. If we got in a position where we couldn't do that because of this perpetuity, that would not be good. Um, and that's all based on the sediment that gets into the Playa Lake and it's not doing its job anymore. Um, I, I just don't know that it's a good idea to press forward. 
And then, um, um, Madam Chair, members of the Parks Board, uh, Commissioner Jones. Yeah, and if, uh, and if you wanted to do your player education program, which is one thing that we have been looking at, and maybe put in, you know, put in a little building there for the children to, you know, to continue, continue with that, you know, promoting conservation and the ply priors and in, in, in their full, um, that could be, you know, we'd have to go to the feds and get all, go through all of that process. And of course, that would be changing the, what we're doing, so. Any other discussion, or may I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we uh, recommend that we do not go forward with the grant. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carries. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, number six, discussion and recommendation regarding capital improvement projects. Mr. Hooper. Yes, uh, Commissioner, I appreciate the opportunity to come here. Um, as you know, we started off with a uh, $375,000 capital improvements. Uh, we've done playgrounds, playground equipment, um, playground installs. We did mulch at Green Acres on the 5 to 12, skate park improvements, um, bleachers, some uh, concrete plaids and shades, <clears throat> and some uh, Beecham concession bathrooms. That's pretty much what we went through on the list. Currently, right now, we're sitting at $38,923.48, just short of $39,000 left out of that grant. Um, kind of what we had left on the board was uh, Stones for Ryerson at $23,000. I rounded that up to 25 because there's always going to be some things going on. What I did find out actually yesterday was the bid that we got for on our playground equipment were short on mulch. So I need to make a $10,000, $500 mulch purchase. Otherwise, we're stuck. I mean, it was one of those things. It was a glitch on the original bid. I've gone back and looked at it, and they just they missed a spot. And I missed that they missed a spot. So it wasn't that we lost any money. We were just never quoted it um, for this $10,500. I've gotten two bids on mulch for Green Acres. One was $18,000 and one was for ten five. dollars So out of the thirty nine, ten five dollars is kind of, I'd say, spoken for, even though y'all still get to vote whether it's spoken for or not, um, which <laughs> kind of leaves about $28,000 left. Um, we had the stones for Ryerson that were going to come out to $25,000 if y'all wanted to go that direction. There was also the possibility of, you know, we could set up another bleacher and shade structure if we, if we, if y'all wanted to. That's going to come out to about fifteen thousand. Um, bleacher and shade structure back at Beach, and whether we hit the third, we put one behind the middle field and one behind the little field. We could do a third one if y'all wanted to go that route instead of the stones. Just kind of, what do y'all want to do? I guess it is where our question is and where it goes. Or was there another idea? I mean, I don't want to just limit it to those two options, but we basically have about 27,000, 28,000 sitting there. Russell, are you talked about doing another dog park. Is that something we could consider with some of these funds or? to be honest with it. Um, and I think this this was limited to the three parks that were at Ryerson, Potter, and uh, Green Acres. And so that would be kind of our options, and none of those would fit. So the rocks at Ryerson, what, what are those going to, what's that going to consist of? Um, what that consists of, we're, we're wanting to pull the fence down around it. Um, there's a rail fence, then there's also a hurricane fence down one side, pipe rail fence down the front. Basically, we're having to maintain it and do stuff all the time, so we'd pull those and put rocks around it because the ultimate theory is you, you don't have to repaint rocks every year. It's those, like those large boulders we have at Hillcrest. And, and that's just for access. Uh, we're, we've got to keep cars out of it. Um, it's one of those things normally they don't happen, but occasionally people decide to drive into our parks for some reason. Um, Jamal, I would like to hear about the bleacher covers where, at Beecham Field. Were they installed? Yes, uh, they installed um, concrete pads, and just last week they got the covers for um, right behind the backstops at um, the T-ball field, 
and the middle field at Potter Park. And um, I think, or, and our, I believe, are we supposed to get bleachers there also? Okay. Um, it, it looks really good. People have been actually just sitting there, and I'm like, man, you know, it would be good to have the side, the side wings. Um, I think I sent Russell some pictures, um, you know, put the bleachers over there. Then, you know, people can come and sit with their chairs, or we can even put a possibly a concession stand or, or something else behind. But um, it, it, they look really good, and um, I said we could use more. Okay. Does anybody else have any other recommendations? Sure. Yeah, come up to the. Just give us your name and address. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Myrna Valdez. My address is 509 West 17th, Clovis, New Mexico. I am a board member for the Western Little League. I'm a player agent and a coach. Um, uh, Beecham has been, it is one of the oldest uh, baseball fields here in New Mexico and Portales. It's our 70th anniversary. We've been in business since 1950. Um, it's come a long ways. What we do need is uh, we would ask for nets, for safety nets between the fields. There's a lot of uh, home runs that are being hit over the fence between the fields. The shade structure, we love it. Um, we do need a scoreboard back there and possibly another concession stand. We do need access to water to feed that field in the back uh, for the girls' softball. It's very loose dirt. We would like, If we could, we would want it to be pressed down and even ask for turf if that's not too much. We're hosting close to 400 kids this year, and our league is just growing and growing. We incorporated softball this year, so we added five teams to our group. About a, each week, we host at least 200 people throughout the week, you know, with the concessions and parents and different teams. We're playing games Monday through Sunday. Sunday's our makeup day, and we're going about eight to nine months throughout the season with our fall and our other, our fall and our spring seasons. But, um, we were also would like to ask for another shade structure on the other sides and possible batting cages. It's whenever the, there's games playing and we're setting up to practice or set up for the games, it's, it's a danger for the kids to be out there because when a pop play comes and we're practicing, we've had a couple of hit, kids hit with the ball, nothing serious, but we don't want it to get serious. Um, we would ask for lights at the t-ball at the t-ball field. We don't have lights there or a scoreboard. Uh, there is safety concerns between the fields when kids are running, there's loose gravel. If we can get uh, sidewalks that connect the fields, I think that would be good for safety. And a small concession stand in the back or a trailer, that way we can manage both fields or host tournaments and that would bring in money to the community. If we can actually use, we have three fields that we can operate to you know, bring people in. We're actually planning on trying to host an event in May. It's going to be a tournament for both softball and baseball, and we're going to invite uh, people around town to see who wants to participate in that to keep our celebration for our 70th anniversary going. Um, let me see if I... Uh, we are asking for the scoreboard in the front for our concession stand. We need a new roof over there and new uh, lighting structures. And... Uh, we don't have a working stereo system, like to make announcements, if we can get that. And I think that's about it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> that's not too much. You don't have a big wish list, do you? No, ma'am. <laughs> Mr. Hooper, time. can you address, please? Um, yes, and obviously, as we, as we know on everything, it's time and money. Um, I know Jamal's brought a bunch of these things forward to us already. Um, if y'all would like me to put any of these things on a list and start getting prices and see how it goes, we can look at that. That's like I say, a lot of it, that's just y'all's direction as we know we've had the discussion with the, everything from our user fees we've been talking about and how we get back into capital right. and how we improve our field. So this all falls under that same category. And one of our board members, Brandon Floyd actually sent an email, a detailed email with all of our requests, just so you know, to, you can look out for that. You know, I wish we had, a million dollars, you know, you could get it. But we have a lot of parks that we have to split up the money. I think Beecham Field has been very blessed with the capital outlay money that we have put in there. Um, all we can do is maybe apply 
for capital outlay money for next year and see if we get anything else for Beecham Field. But I feel like we had already designated money for the stones at Ryerson. In my opinion, that's a safety issue there also. I, like I said, I wish we could help and complete your dream list. But everything takes time and everything takes money. And we just have to divide up the money between all the parks that we do have. And we'll take, even if you just pick one out of this list, we'll even take that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, that was, I think, one of the things was initially our prioritization was, I think, low-hanging fruit, things we could do really cheaply and easily, and then safety. Right. Um, and I, I, I like the rock as well because it does eliminate future expenses um, and that, maintenance. that now feed back in that's, that we've eliminated. But, yeah, the list is... Uh, you know, it's, you, you hate to hear the list, but if we focus back on those original requests and the safety aspect of things, maybe we look at those. Right. Madam Chair, I, I would like to see this get that list put together and, and start getting quotes on some of this stuff just so that when we do have the money that, uh, available, we can, uh, we can start looking at funding some of those things. Um, and also, we're going to have just a little bit of cash left over. Not, it's not a lot, but maybe we could look at uh, the this, this serial system or the announce, announcement system because we might be able to, to get that with their remaining funds. And Madam Chairman, uh, members of the Park Board, we can certainly do that. Yes, ma'am. Name my and name, address. My name is Ashley Marquez. My address is 1521 Westchester, Clovis, New Mexico. Um, as far as Beach and Fields, right now we only have one bathroom, and that's the men's bathroom. And that's in the middle as far as all three fields. I have a three-year-old that's potty training, and we're having to use the men's bathroom. I'm sure that the other restrooms in the concession in, associated with the concession stand are on the list, but right now we're all having to use the men's bathroom. No toilet paper, nothing. And as far, I mean, as far as the league, they're taking care of what they can, but the women's bathroom, the door has an issue. We can't get in it. So as far as my three-year-old, we're having to run back and forth, and we're all trying to take care of her as well. And as me, I'm our scorekeeper. So it's just an up and up and up thing. We're having to go back and forth. That's another thing we would like to get addressed as far as getting those fixed. I'm sure it's on the list as far as all the bathrooms. But that's a big deal for As far as females, we're all having to go into the men's bathroom because there's a door issue with the female's bathroom. And as far as the other bathroom, I'm guessing there's issues as far as repairs that that's connected to the concession stand. So that's Thank another you. issue as far. Mr. Hooper. <laughs> and, and to address, I, I, I was not aware of the women's restroom. I'm just... Yeah, there, it's the same handle. Um, it only opens one way. We've um, tried to fix it. It'll have to be replaced, but the, it's the one in the outfield. Okay, yeah, and like I said, I just wasn't aware. I thought I... Thought both men's and women's were operational um, in the middle of the fields. Um, as far as the toilet paper stuff like that, I mean, obviously that falls back on the league. It's as as a, as it being y'all's restroom that you're used for your facility as opposed to the parks. Uh, I know we have the two portalettes that they put out in the front across the street in the parking lot. It's a little far away, but we do have some other ones there, and then the other ones should be getting completed soon underneath the concession. Yeah, I, I'm, unfortunately, that's that's what I'm getting is we're getting all the final parts in and we should be we're close to completion. Is the last partition going to be a week or two? Weeks? I that I don't know. You know how shipping is these days. Can, can we get a look at that door handle though and oh, get that the ladies' restroom fixed? Oh, definitely. We'll have someone look at it tomorrow. Thank you. Anybody else? Do we have any other questions from the public? The committee. Madam Chair. Yes. <laughs> um, we were talking about safety. Um, I know they're taking that um, net down at Harris Field. Um, I know I've addressed it. I think it's a really a it's, it is really a cons big concern of mine. And um, you know, I try to schedule the fields you know as best I can and have the bigger boys on the certain days. But um, I get balls like the the next field is directly in line. Of a, of a baseball, you know, coming at, you know, someone looking at with their back turned to the other game. So if, um, 
I said, we can get a safety net or something or use the one from Harris or some something to address that um, that safety issue if we could. And I believe you're talking about, yeah, to where we raise the outfield fence on the larger one and then add some netting. And again, I'll just need to get a cost on that. Madam Chair and Board, I, this is the second time I've heard about the bathrooms at Beecham. Um, and even if we can put a sign pointing, you know, on on the the bathrooms that aren't working, where the porta stalls are, just so, because I went to find them, I drove by twice, because I was looking to the at the fields versus over at the parking spot, and I think that's where the parking lot, and maybe just a sign pointing people toward the toward the porta stalls. And I, I feel like maybe the next um, capital outlay money we can put in for other restrooms at Beecham Field. Because I know they do have a lot of tournaments and there is a lot of kids. And some little kids, when they got to go, they got to go. They can't walk, you know, 100 feet to a bathroom. So maybe that's a consideration. If not, maybe we can put more porter potties out there if they're having a tournament or when they're having a tournament. Because I know they have cars from Grand First Street, I think it is, all the way to 7th Street. So it is a big tournament. So we will work on that. Any other questions? Recommendations? Okay, updates. Um, what about the 75,000? Oh. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fix the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Do I have a motion or? This is for the 25000 for the ricin? Yes. For the rest of the money that we have left over, any recommendations, any motions? About the rocks flats. Yes. Yes, I think we do. I would recommend that we do uh, purchase the rocks to put around ricin. Yes. And the 10-5 for the mulch. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Same sign, no. Motion passes. Thank you. And then we have dual left front. Is that part of that one? No, it's not part of that one. There's another left front there. Okay. Okay. Did you get? We're, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Updates. Mr. Hooper, Parks and Rec update, please. Sorry, just have a second. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Commissioner. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had some more money, but apparently we don't. Okay. Not a, yeah, not a test for that. Yes. Okay. Zoo update. Damien. Update, you well, you me. didn't answer me when I asked. I thought you didn't have <laughs> nothing to say. <laughs> he was ignoring you, Madam Chair. He was ignoring me. <laughs> I apologize for that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Russell. Yes, uh, I do have some rec updates. Uh, my first rec update is I would like to introduce our new recreation administrator. This is Alora Milne. Hi. Um, she's new to town, new to the city. She's from the base. She was. She's been working at rec centers in night or England or Lakenhurst and all places I've never heard of that they were talking to me today. Um, we flooded each other with information. Um, if you would like... If Laura, can you come and... <laughs> Let's correct what he had to say. Okay, how do I... Oh, is it already on? Okay. Um, I'm Alara Milne, and I have been working for child and youth programs for the United States Air Force for about 12 years. I started at the bottom, and I worked my way up to the top. Um, I, we just PCS in from Mountain Home, um, Idaho, which is smaller than Clovis, and I actually love being here so far. Um, I, my, my favorite part of my job is working with kids and I have a special bond with children. Um, my, the one thing that I'm probably really good at is also, um, 
working with teens. Uh, when I left, that was my main, main project. The Air Force puts a lot into their teen programs, and so I'm pretty proficient on that and getting money and getting programs started for kids who need help. So I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really excited that Russell picked me to do this job. Um, I've already cleaned up the gym today because it was very dusty, so <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we kind of started off throwing her into a deep end. Obviously, we got the summer youth program coming up, which she's done a lot of those programs before. So we're, we're really working with Claire and everybody else to make sure she gets up to speed pretty quickly and we get that everything goes. Um, one of the other interesting things about her is, you know, we do all the questionnaires when we hire and we go through all certain questions. And it was real interesting when I got to that question about, you know, what do you, what do you define responsibility as? And her answer was, don't lose any kids. So uh, I figured this is something we could go with. That would be one of our high priorities all summer long in the rec. So it, it was good. And I think it's going to be a good fit. She's got a positive attitude. and She's ready to, ready to keep us on our journey. We, we've made some good direction over the last year. Tari was a great person, got us started and heading in a direction. And this is just going to continue on with that. Um, so there's my main rec update. Uh, we On rec desk, uh, which all approved all the software here before. So we've started working on that. We've got our basic set up. We've created programs, um, facilities, swim lesson signups. We have a planned go live date by May 1st. So we should have that up and running by the end of the month. So our summer youth program will be all signed up through Rec Desk. Um, it's gonna be a real simple process. You'll have to go in, you set up an account for yourself. You set up an account for your kids and then you just start signing them up for things. Um, I'm hoping within the next month we'll be able to do all our payments online. Uh, we're working with finance to do that to where you can just do, basically do the whole thing with your phone, sign the credit cards, do a parent wa waiver, um, sign off on a code of conduct, and you're set. So that's, that's basically where we're at. So we're having some real good progress with that. Sandy and Allure are working to make sure it, it goes live here in the next couple of weeks. Um, on our swim lessons, we already have two parent and child classes that are already full, and we have two preschool learn to swim classes that are full. So first signups, things have been going great. We had that uh, first, I guess it's not a first annual, since it's an inaugural aquatics Easter extravaganza, uh, we really didn't know what to expect. We wound up having 181 swimmers show up. So it just, um, as Vicki will tell you, it, there was a bunch of fish flopping around out there in that water, uh, collecting eggs and bringing them in for candy. So it was a real interesting and positive event. Uh, the ATA, which is the American Trap Association, um, I don't know the numbers of the people, but they had over $4,000 for the event for the weekend. Do you have... Okay. Yeah. Wait for the... Okay, let us very good. Um, we did the zoo numbers. We've done $6,000 for the weekend. We had a real blast the week. Um, the zoo has done 20000 for the month of April, and that's two weeks and a couple of days. Just between the weather, some school groups, some different things like that, we've, it, it's been amazing between the gift shop and the, and the zoo money, or the zoo funds now at the gate entrances. Um, upcoming, we have Arbor Day on April 28th. Uh, 10 a.m. We'll be planting four trees at Hillcrest Park around the do around the dog park. Just try to put some things there. We need to. Some of the trees are getting old, so we need to put some more and throw some back. Um, we have Cummings Natural Gas Engines. They are going to be donating eight bur oak trees. They have volunteered, and they will be planting those in Hillcrest Park on uh, Saturday the 29th. So, other than that, we are just gearing up for spring. And that would be my Parks and Rec update. Very good report, Russell. Thank you. Um, Damien, zoo update. I have a question. Kind of touched briefly on it. Um, was two weeks ago when I went to Albuquerque, a whole bunch of zoos got together. Um, it was Alameda Zoo, Albuquerque, uh, Desert Willow Wildlife Rehab, Amarillo. Of course, um, I represented us. A Navajo Nation Zoo. New Mexico Wildlife Center, Spring, Spring River Zoo, um, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and New Mexico Game and Fish were, were all there. 
um, we're just trying to all get on the same page um, and, and just work together. So um, it was a great two days, um, learned a lot, um, met a lot of new people. So now kind of, kind of expands our reach. So that was really productive. Uh, this Saturday, um, ENMU is coming out to volunteer to build a lot of enrichment items for the animals. So they're coming in the morning, and then right after that, um, uh, Wells Fargo is coming out to volunteer in the afternoon, um, and they're going to plant um, all of the empty planters that, uh, that we have in the zoo. So really excited about that. Um, starting to get those big volunteer groups in, I guess uh, with the weather being nice. Uh, Michael Fish, um, he started his mural work this weekend. So if you haven't driven by the zoo, uh, you, uh, you should swing by. It's starting to look really good. Um, I believe that's going to take two and a half more weeks to finish it, but um, I like what I see already. And I guess the biggest one um, is we're getting ready for our USDA repermitting. Um, so, uh, so for USDA, um, our permit um, was good for a year. Um, it's, it's changed. Now we're on a three-year cycle, which is um, a lot more scrutiny. It's, um, that inspection is a, is a lot more involved uh, than it has been in the past. So, so we're just, you know, just trying to have the zoo look the best that, you know, that, uh, that it, it can. Um, one thing, though, that came up is, uh, again, I know I talked about this before, that was the perimeter fence. Um, we keep patching the, uh, the perimeter fence, and it's no, it's no longer um, acceptable to USDA. Um, she wants the entire perimeter fence redone. Um, that is a really big project. It's a really um, expensive project as well. Um, so, just having a couple, uh, uh, just a couple talks with her, she's okay if we, if we fix uh, the worst parts now with the chain link fence. And as long as we have a plan moving forward, um, you know, uh, uh, like a contract uh, with a company saying that this will be fixed, she's okay with that. It's just, it, you know, it's, it's just patching it constantly. So we patch one part, she comes out, she finds another part, we patch that. I mean, she's always gonna find um, an issue with that. And I think that's the issue with the chain link. So we wanted to go with a solid metal fence with a concrete barrier on the bottom. And uh, I'm not sure if y'all are aware of like a few months ago uh, with Roswell Zoo um, that they put up a fence um, and then those three dogs got out um, and, and, and those three dogs killed a bunch of animals in their zoo. So that's, that's why this is such a hot topic right now with USDA. So um, I already have the three bids, uh, so we're working on that. And um, I believe I have the money. Um, <laughs> working on that? Yeah. Um, but so we're going to move forward with that, and um, and that's all the updates that I have. Um, as an additional, you got someone starting new also, don't you? I'm sorry. You've got someone starting new also next week. I I do, but I I like to always wait until they're actually physically here. But I guess <laughs> I can talk about it. Um, she is very excited to come. Uh, so uh, so we have a curator starting. Um, she will be here uh, a week from today. Um, she has worked at the San Antonio Zoo, the El Paso Zoo, tons of bird experience, tons of management experience, and um, a, lo a lot of AZA experience. So for that accreditation is really going to help. So we're really, really excited. But again, um, you know, until their feet are actually here um, and, the, and, they're, and, they're, and they're working. So that's why I was going to wait till the next one, but um, I'm sure she'll be here. <laughs> Very uh, good report. Ms. Burroughs. Um, could we think of a fundraising for the fence? I mean, our citizens are very enthused about our zoo, and I feel like we can come up with some kind of a fundraiser to make have money. Um, we certainly can, Madam Chair, members of the Parks Board. Um, we're actually doing a kangaroo contest at the moment, a naming contest, which we hope will bring in some funds to the zoo. Uh, but no, I'd be happy to work with Ms. Darrow and Mr. Lechner on, on some solutions to help I funding mean, this. What is everybody's thought on that? Taco Box can donate burritos. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's a thought. Thank you. Let's get that fence up. I've, I've got a question for Damien. How long do we have 
till this inspector comes back? So um, tentatively, our, our inspection is, I um, believe it's the 24th of next month. Um, our, our permit expires in July. So uh, the reason why uh, we're doing it before, um, so uh, to pass the three year, you have to have zero discrepancies. It, it, you have to be perfect. And um, so if you do the first inspection, if she finds one thing wrong, um, and then you have two more chances to actually get re-permitted. Um, if that happens and, and then you don't pass, um, once your permit expires and if they don't renew it, um, you can't open until you have a permit and then you have to wait six months. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to push that a little bit early so that when we do, I, I'm pretty confident if, if we fix the fence, um, we'll do well in the permitting inspection but that just gives us enough time that if she does find something that gives us enough time to fix it um, before July. So that's kind of why we were trying to give it a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, but I guess um, I, I guess that was a long-winded answer, but uh, it would be July. And I, I have a question on, on the budget. As far as the zoo budget goes, can we get a breakdown of that so we can see when you say that you think that you have the money, is that something that we can look at too to maybe help find more money to put in with the fence? Since the zoo is its own separate budget and not in with this other. So with, so with the zoo improvement funds, um, um, I do have the funds um, in the zoo improvement. However, that would pretty much wipe out my, my zoo improvements so um, I know we, we have a lot of things that we wanna fix and a lot of things that need to be fixed. Obviously the fence is, is the most important. If USDA wants it fixed, that, I mean, it needs to be fixed. But yeah, I mean, that would definitely hurt my budget for up until July 1st, uh, depending on, on what the new budget would, uh, would be. And, and on that budget, there's a, there's a zoo improvement fund that is funded mostly by gate receipts, gift shop, things along those lines. So we may have pulled out of something to where we got, let's say we were about to think about getting Damien a new tractor. Well, there's 50 grand. Well, if we pull that out of it, now are we gonna roll over, and it rolls over every year. So it's not like we it's money we ever lose, but we don't know if they're gonna roll over 350 or they're 375. You know, we had a $20,000 month, so that's gonna help us roll in more. Um, Theoretically, it should be a growing fund, but then we also have plans for the Sooner Habitat and some of these others that need to come into place. We also don't want to ever deplete the fund in case they come in next inspection. She says, you got to fix these sidewalks and you got 14 days. We got to make sure we have something always in there that we can work with. But we're we'll also be glad for y'all to look for more opportunities to give us more funding. <laughs> I mean, being that Clovis has the second largest zoo in the state, I think the citizens of Clovis really love their zoo, and I, I think they can open their pocketbook up a little bit and help us. So let's see what we can do and work on that. Um, Madam Chair, yes. um, I have a question for Mr. Lechner. Um, can you tell me how many feet, how long is this perimeter fence? Do you have that? Do you have that number? I want to say 3,200. See, that sounds correct. Yeah, because uh, I believe I had just sent it to you a few days ago. Yeah, I think it's the. And did I understand that correctly? That it's it has to, you're expecting that to be done by July. No, so um, so there's one part. Um, it's kind of meets up uh, where the ball field is. Um, every every big windstorm we have, uh, that fence gets knocked down, so we put it back up. Um, it's seems structurally sound next wind comes and then it, it comes down so so that unfortunately um, I have to pay to fix knowing that that fence is going to be replaced but uh, uh, there's no way around it um, as long as any area that that does not meet a USDA standard has to be fixed by by July um, we can still have the the old fence but we have to have a plan in place um, uh, she wants to see a contract uh, with a contractor saying uh, that we're moving forward 
or to show that, yes, we have the funds to actually fix this. Um, so if it takes us six months to fix, she's okay with that. She's just, uh, I just want to make sure there's no holes underneath where animals can get un underneath. She wants to make sure it's, it's at least eight feet. So with the bids that, that I got, um, uh, it's, a, it's an eight-foot metal fence with a one-foot barbed wire on the top because the minimum is eight feet. And that's exactly what our fence is now. It's, it's eight feet. So if one of those strings falls, um, and, then, and then we're no longer compliant. Um, but if we have that extra foot, if those strings fall down, that fence is still eight foot. Um, that just kind of gives us that little bit of buffer. Um, and then also not being chain linked, that stops a lot of people from trying to, to enter the zoo. And I also think, Gordon, because we, we had a conference call with the lady from the USDA, and what we're, what we're planning on is a three-phase project. She just doesn't want us to do phase one and then two years later do phase two. And she wants to make sure we have it all in place and all organized, and I think that's where our leeway is. So, no, we understand we're not doing 3,000 feet in 30 days. That would be a heck of a project. Price would probably go up. Okay, Great American Cleanup, May 6, 2023, Ms. Burroughs. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the Parks Board. Yes, we are really excited um, to be holding the uh, Great American Cleanup this year. i um, like to invite the public to come out and join us on your good cells if you're available between 8 o'clock and noon on Saturday, May the 6th. Um, we will be uh, doing the same things we always do every year. Uh, uh, you can take your trash. Anybody in Curry County can take their trash to the uh, Clovis Regional Landfill for free from noon on the Friday until noon on the Monday. And you're limited to nine 16-inch tires. That's correct, um, uh, per, per household. So please come out and join us. Um, we'll be providing donuts and goodies for breakfast and then lunch, and we'll be recognizing the uh, the three top groups that will be picking up bags. So if you know any organizations in town that would like to come and join us, uh, we uh, welcome them to please contact Parks and Recreation, 7697870. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burroughs. For the good of the order, do we have anybody? Well, come on up. Members, <laughs> Steve Coffin. I work at the uh, Clovis Wing Shooting Range, for Mr. Hooper. The uh, reference to our ATA shoot, uh, we have been open now for roughly six months. And we got most of a range uh, when we, we took that over. We've been uh, rapidly improving it to the degree that we can. Uh, the ATA is the Amateur Trap Shooting Association. It has uh, tens of thousands of members in the U.S. Uh, we had 50 of them which was a good turnout for us this time. Uh, it was the inaugural competition event out at the range, uh, the first of what we hope will be many out there. Uh, it took us about three or four weeks of administrative prep and about a week of actual prep to be able to, to host this. Uh, the ATA representatives, uh, including uh, Mr. Miller, who happened to show up, not at my request, I'm gonna put that out there right now, uh, did most, if not all, of the legwork to, to present everything. We opened the gates and turned the lights on and gave them access to their uh, trap shooting range, and they, they took it from there and did a great job. Uh, so really, it was, it was the competitors, it was the staff, uh, it was the volunteers that they got to come out and score and sit out there for all day long and listen to guns going for uh, eight or ten hours a day, and then it was the two of us from the wing shooting staff. Uh, the competitors shot three different disciplines out there. If you're not a trap shooter, I won't bother boring you with them. Um, but it goes on and on and on and on, trust me. And, and we constantly were moving squads through the different disciplines in the trap fields, the four trap fields we have. Fifty overall competitors from uh, Texas and New Mexico. I thought we had one from Arizona, but uh, apparently that was not correct. We thought shot over 19,000 clay targets in two days uh, between the squads. Uh, comes out to about 385 per person out there. Some of them shot more, some of them shot less, uh, but that's the way it went. Uh, as Mr. Hooper said, we grossed over 4,000 bucks in two days. For us, that is great. Uh, if you subtract the hours, extra hours it took to host that, it only cost the city 210 bucks to host that event from a labor standpoint. Uh, 
obviously electricity and whether else is sunk costs, uh, whether we're there or not. And we were there anyway on Saturday and Sunday, but it was only the extra hours. Subtract the cost of the clays, we still made about 1700 bucks in two days, which is larger than our best month to date. So if we could do that uh, more often, which obviously is the goal, and then it would start to pay for itself. The beautiful part about this is about 60%, the uh, estimates go from 40 to 80%, so we shot in the middle. 60% of the competitors are from out of town, and they stayed in local hotels, ate at local restaurants, bought local gas, and uh, you can take it from there what the, uh, you know, the calculus is for what that actually meant to the city. Uh, the things we did great, or that we got to keep doing. Uh, we groomed and prepped the facility, spent a lot of time making sure that it was, it was clean and it was ready. It's always been clean and it's always been ready. But uh, if you'll allow me, Wing shooting is a boutique sport. It's a niche sport. Not everybody can afford, in fact, I would say not very many people can afford both the hardware and the ammunition to go out and do this. It's expensive. So it is a boutique niche sport, and you attract a certain type of folks that come out there. Now, we had a great youth turnout. There's a lot of youth league and youth shooting here in the New Mexico high school uh, clay target shooting league around here, and they showed uh, very well. Uh, and so the point I'm trying to make is when they roll up in a trap range or a skeet range, there's an expectation of what they get out of that range. And we are meeting that, and we had a lot of great comments for the facility, uh, and I didn't really hear too much grousing out there. Um, and I don't, Mr. Miller might be able to give you more on that. He was out there among them uh, when this was going on. Uh, we reached out early to the event coordinators. Uh, it's easy because one of them lives a mile from my house. So, uh, but we got to them early about how do we get this out there and what does it take to work with the city. And Mr. Hooper facilitated a lot of that activity, getting that done early. Uh, we provided indoor and outdoor accommodation for them, for, set up their donation for their food people and all that, their admin area. They came inside, set up, had a squad, their restrooms and everything else was set up for them. Um, and one thing we did is we defined the facilities and behavior boundaries pretty early out there. You know, no smoking, if you do, pick up your butt, no drinking. Normal uh, gun stuff, but also it's a city facility. This is not your down-home club, you know, in the town you came from where there's two trap fields and, and the, the guys you know work at the local pick a thing and own it. It's a city facility, and so we kind of had to make that clear. The things that need work, uh, we need a second dumpster. Filled it up the first day. Because they, you, 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 when you take clays out, you generate a lot of box trash, a lot of cardboard trash. We ended up having to get into the dumpster and empty it and break them all down, which took a bunch of time to get that done. I know the city has dumpsters. Maybe those SCA people who never use that spot right up the road, we can take their dumpster. It's all broken, too, by the way, but it'll work for us. Uh, I'll say this as, as diplomatically as I can. We had no advertising from the city on it despite uh, that I can discern, <laughs> despite uh, efforts to provide avenues to uh, advertise this, uh, they did most of the advertising um, throughout the network. I, I heard over and over again, we didn't even know your range was here. Um, we heard from other competitors, well, we knew Bob and, and Bill were gonna come, but we didn't hear about this till the last minute, um, so they couldn't change their plans. Um, these things do take some advertising, and it's not expensive advertising. Not like we're buying a billboard because most of the competitors won't see it. Uh, but there is social media and there are periodicals that are not expensive to get into. And once we actually get an annual schedule, we can advertise and folks uh, will we'll know that, that we're doing it. And uh, entities like the Amateur Trap Shooting Association and Skeet Shooting and Sporting Clays can work that into their competition schedules like a motocross race or baseball game or whatever down the road. Uh, some required equipment still for the range, we still don't have. Uh, we found out that we were missing some, some, uh, some parts out there. We didn't find out till now because we, we didn't know we needed it. <laughs> um, and, and we'll address that with Mr. Hooper to go ahead and, and buy those things. They're readily available. We'll get that stuff and uh, solve it. We worked around it this time, and everybody had a great attitude about that that was uh, shooting out there. Uh, one thing is a very, uh, it's a very small, you know, it's a, it's a detail that doesn't really uh, hit the rest of the city much, but those trap machines have sat out there. The things that actually throw the clays have sat out there for a long time, for a long time unused out there. And so we're finding it's like an airplane. Uh, you got to fly the thing to make the thing work all the time. And so 
uh, we're finding some problems with the trap machines. And so we have another event in two and a half weeks, and we have one the month after that. And then we start right again in August and then September again. So uh, we're working on getting the machines uh, back up to speed for where they need to be because you're throwing clays constantly all day long. You're throwing those things, and so they got to be up there. Overall, it was a success. We made a bunch of money in a, in a little bit of time. Uh, nobody got hurt. Everybody had a great time. Uh, good results as far as I can tell. And if there's no questions, uh, that concludes this. Sir, overall, I think I think it was a good success. I feel like the competition, it, it could have been advertised more. And, I mean, it, was, it wasn't a city event, was it? It is, it is not. It, right. So we just have the facility and we host it for them. Contact the Chamber of Commerce. They are great advertisers. They have, I mean, over 700 members. They can get your word out for the next competition. This was the first competition out there. So overall, it seems like everything went well. Oh, yep. So let's just keep working together and see if we can improve it out there. You bet. And Madam Chair, uh, members of the Parks Board, I'm going to be out at the base at the air show this weekend promoting the shooting range. And then we also have a, several city booths at the Home and Garden show and we'll be promoting the shooting range out there too. So We'll help you get the word out. Thanks. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> this is, this is uh, more geared towards uh, the city. Uh, do we have a marketing budget for these facilities like the shooting range and, and whatnot? Uh, yes, sir. We do have different marketing budgets for, di for different departments. Um, part of our problem on the shooting range is one, I, I guess there was some of the impression of it, it was the ATA event. We thought they would handle it. We were providing the facility. So I think there was some confusion there, I, mo mostly on my part, I'll admit, of does the city promote their event? I think these are things that are gonna happen in the future. Um, some of that builds momentum from a first event to a second to a third to next year's to the sixth annual, things along those lines, where we will build up more of a, a presence in social media. Also finding the proper ones that bang for the buck, I guess would be the proper thing. And as you, as you know, you've, you've advertised in different things over the years and which one is actually is worth the money and which of them are not. So we're still working on some of that. The shooting range, since it came up as an original, this was not expected two years ago that we were doing it, so we are still are playing with some of the budget for this, for some of that. So, But there is budgets for different departments and different events, and Claire might have more. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Parks Board, Commissioner. Um, yes, we are work going through the budget process right now and looking at all the different departments, including the shooting range and the advertising for that. Um, Ms. Darrow, uh, while we don't have a specific budget set out for parks, I mean, we certainly do that for the shooting range piece. Um, and I'd be happy to work with Mr. Coffin on those periodicals. If you let me know what they are and, and how much they are, we can have a look at that and you guys can look at it, commissioners, during the budget. Thank you. I think I just I just want to make this statement. I, I don't think that I, I w my intention wasn't to ask if the city was gonna promote specific events. I absolutely believe that those events um, are responsible for their own uh, uh, marketing. I do, however, from a broader perspective, think that it's, it's in our best interest to, to promote the facility um, regionally and in the proper uh, locations. And of course, I would look to gentlemen like this that would know where we would say, hey, let people know, and social media is a fantastic and super inexpensive way to do it. I like that avenue, and so I think we should absolutely pursue that from a broader perspective. And Madam Chair, you have great people out there, um, April Holmes and Mr. Coffin, who are both working for the city of Clovis, are doing just a bang up job, no yes, pun intended. They, yes, they are. Very good job. Thank you, and thank you guys for all your work out there. Madam Chair and Board, I did, is this not something that lodger's tax could be approached with? But the city facility, but if it's... Um, uh, 
um, Madam Chair, and members of the Parks Board, Mr. Martin, yes, I mean, uh, the the organisation could approach for, for lodges tax for promotional funding, yes, most certainly. Can I'll be happy to work with you on that. Any other questions? Recommendations? If not... I do have... And it's not, sorry, Madam Chair and Board, I do have a question um, to back up to the um, Great American Cleanup. Why do we limit tires by size and by numbers? Um, it's, it's to do with public works and then the fact that you could get lots of folk in town who are like tire dealerships and everything bringing lots of tires unnecessarily to the landfill during the course of the event. Are there alternate places to disp dispose of tires? Like, uh, what is the other, what, what are other solutions for tires other than? So what we've been doing, I mean, uh, we, we just had a raid grant um, through, the, uh, through the environment department where we brought a tire shredder into town. Um, I think it cost like $36,000 for about a week or so that we had it. Um, and Roosevelt County, Curry County, everyone brought all their tires to the landfill and we shredded a lot of tires. Unfortunately, we can't use those tires in our, the shredded tires in our parks because of the wire, the metal that's in them, um, but it gets shredded up and taken away. Um, other than that, I don't know of anywhere else that takes them locally. And of course, if you are in the county, you could, you know, you could store your tires out. I mean, this is, they're trying to limit the, the amount of tires that are coming in to the landfill for free. Because otherwise, you could be bringing a lot of tires in and they create a they take up a lot of space in the landfill. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, next meeting, date and time, Monday, May 15th, 2023. Meeting adjourned.